Hi, my name is Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. Thanks for joining me for this IPA talk, and I am grateful to have with me for his debut appearance here on IPA Talk, Ron Nazoe, who is the Chief Executive Officer, the CEO of the National Association of Secondary School Principals, which, you know, I for some, Ron, may still be new, just getting familiar with you, but you've been on the job a while. It's just you, you were one of these unique individuals that started during the pandemic. So, uh, you know, but I, I am grateful that in the last, you know, 12 months or so, especially as we kind of started navigating into this quasi uh, endemic phase of COVID, you've, you've spent a lot of time on the road, you've gotten to conferences, you, thanks to for coming to our 50th anniversary conference in Peoria this past October, all that good stuff. So, uh, it's sure a pleasure here to finally have you join me on this uh, on this IPA talk. Well, first of all, Jason, thanks for inviting me. And and real close to that, uh, just thanks to you for all the work that you and IPA do in service of kids and educators everywhere. And then, of course, a, a greeting and thanks to every one of the folks that are tuning into this. All, Illinois school leaders, you know, this is these are some interesting times to say the least. And just thank you all for your leadership and service for what you do for kids and families every day. I appreciate that. Thanks, Ron. So just thought it'd be good uh, for those that don't know you to have you give us a little bit of background. And I'm sure everybody would love to be able to visit you in your home state of Hawaii <laughs> as, as quickly as possible, as much as they could, uh, especially during those cold, cooler winter months uh, here in Illinois. But would you mind just sharing a little bit of your background with us? Sure. Uh, I'm a secondary language arts teacher by training, uh, a child of uh, two career long public educators. My mom was a elementary school teacher for 35 years, give or take. And my dad was a you know counselor, coach, uh, assistant principal, principal, and then district a central office guy for, for another 35 some odd years. So Grew up around education, around the table. Swore that I wouldn't be an educator, uh, you know, because I hear my parents all, you know, all day long and all night long. My mom grading papers all night. My dad dealing with all kinds of stuff, and I'm like, I'm not working this hard. Was gonna go be an attorney, and then somewhere along that journey, was like, wait a minute, like, uh, call to service, you know, want to do something for the greater good. Uh, not that that's not possible in in law, but you know, there's much 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 closer to the field in, in education. So I went back into education and uh, loved being a teacher. You know, I've taught every grade level from seven to 12 language arts and then never wanted to love teaching, never wanted to leave the classroom, but I got recruited into it, recruited into it. <laughs> you know, you all, all you yep. educators, you know how this works. This, yep. My principal came to me and gave me the speech, you know, all this good work you're doing with the 150 kids that you got, Imagine what you could do with a whole school. And of course, you know, the hook was oh. set. I can't get out of that. I uh, got yanked uh -huh. into it and then was able to serve as principal and then uh, district superintendent in Hawaii and then was the state deputy before being asked uh, in the Obama administration to be appointed by him at the United States Department of Ed. And then after that, spent a little bit of time at ASCD, which was an amazing, wonderful experience. My first foray into nonprofit and then... Mm -hmm ended up here at NASSP, which continues to be the greatest uh, honor, of, you know, and, and definitely in my life and my family's life and just the real privilege to be part of the team and get to work with folks like you and your brother and sister executive directors and, of course, serve all the school leaders and student leaders in our great country. So, uh, yeah, you bet. So, uh, so let me ask you a couple of follow ups there, Ron. First off, what, what drew you to the NASSP position? Uh, I, I wasn't looking for a job. The recruiters sure. reached out and said, hey, we think that you'd be a, a great candidate for this position. I was like, no, I got a good job. I like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've never, I've never tried to get any of the jobs that I, mm -hmm. the stuff that I just listed out there. It, it was always folks saw stuff in me perhaps that I didn't see in myself. And so I've just been very fortunate to uh, in this case, especially with NASSP, they just reached out out of the blue. And I was like, well, you know, I wasn't thinking of leaving, but, but having been a member of NASSP and HASA, our, our state association, as well as a member of NAESP and our state association, HEMSA, I, you know, I, I really believe in the strength and the importance and um, value of a, of both the state and national organizations. And I thought, well, man, like if, 
the opportunity to go come back and give back and serve based on all the stuff that I'd learned over my career is a no brainer for me. So um, yeah. that's Love how it that. ended up. That's terrific. Well, let me, let me ask one other question here. When you reflect back on your, uh, your days as a building leader, a building principal and such, uh, you, what, what are the memories that you find most fondly to reflect on? Um, they're all about people, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know, um, seeing, you know, seeing the talents in folks, both, both kids and adults that maybe they didn't see, you know, it's that same the addiction to teaching that thing that, that human action, interaction, having people like, uh, you know, seeing and believing in people, things that they don't think they could possibly do, and then figuring out how to work with them in a way that puts them in a position to really take control of that for their own lives and, and really be self-directed and really, you know, chart out their own path to like their self-actualization goals. Mm -hmm. And then watching all that come together, that's, that's definitely one. And then two is, this, this magic of when you create those systems and structures and you build a culture around those things where you, where you really, it's not really step back and watch it happen because it requ requires a, just a constant, you know, care and feeding in different ways. But watching that journey of self-actualization in people is just something, you know, is, I, I said it earlier in an addiction since I'm addicted to that. I can't, I, I just, I just love it when people figure that way out so that they can one, do better for others, do more for others, but also mm -hmm. fulfill their own life goals and career goals. And, and those, when those things line up, that's to me is magic. And that's, I strive for that every single day in every context that I can possibly be in. Yeah. And collaboratively just building something special, right. Uh, that's going to help kids and help their communities, all of that. Uh, there's just not much better you could be doing. No, no, it's, it's really yeah. uh, both an honor and a privilege. Yeah, for sure. So, Ron, obviously, as I referenced, you came into NASSP at a, at a unique time. Uh, and it's been interesting for me during the last couple of years. You know, I've been at, at this air at IPA for a while now. Uh, but uh, and it's interesting listening to you talk about your, your family situation, because I came with, from a family of educators as well. Like you never plan on getting nope. into the quote unquote family business at that point. But but here we are. Right. So what are you going to do? But you come into this position at a unique time, obviously, with, with COVID, extraordinary time. Hopefully, we never experience anything like it again in our lifetime, as, uh, as, as hopefully we're getting out of it. But, you know, coming into the, into the National Association, you know, what did you find yourself thinking and doing as, as leader of NASSP? What, what kinds of things did, did NASSP were you organizationally really trying to, to accomplish with, uh, with supporting school leaders during this, this time? Well, first and foremost, coming into NASSP, it was it was clear not just from reviewing stuff, but also from having conversations with people and and, and thinking about how we would want to approach the our strategic planning. It was clear that you know we had a lot more work to be done around true like real relationship building. You know, not the kind that's like superficial, like hi hi. You know, we say hi to in the, each other in the hallway or at a conference or something, but really building these sort of real personal connections and and building the organization around those personal connections was was really evident to me and you know it like you know there were a lot of great things happening with state associations but there was a lot more that we can and need to do together going forward you know to uh build those relationships and repair some of the you know maybe not as pleasant exchanges or experiences that we've had or relationships we had so that was one two the organization had been you know had 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 a couple of strategic plans in the past or strategic intent documents in the past. And, but talking to folks, it wasn't real clear to anyone, you know, both internally and externally, exactly what were we about and what were we trying to do? So that was the second bucket really approaching like, well, we need to, one, we need to really engage people and all of our members and all of our state associations to figure out what is it that people really want? Like we all have ideas about stuff, but this is a member association at its core and, we will do what our members need and want and expect of us. And so how do you do that if you don't have a relationship one? And then two, if you're not having these conversations with folks to sort of ferret that out. So those two things really drove us. And then ultimately, um, the board was very interested in three things with the association, which we, we share that same commitment, which was, uh, you know, really, how do we really engage and empower and, and, uh, really just expand the power of membership at both the state and the national associations. 
Second, where is NASSP in relation to the big table? You know, what's our what's our what's our impact at the at the federal level, and of course at the state level as well. But for us as a national, what's our impact at the national level, and how are we really at the forefront of anything educational, any conversations or any decisions or any contemplations about what's going to happen nationally in education? And then the third was this sort of relationship with our sister organization, NAESP. And how can we work together with ESP in a way that maybe hasn't wasn't you know wasn't as well developed that needed to be? And so from there, I mean, it was really that was just the genesis of where we are with the strategic plan. And and I'm very proud of the work that has happened so far and the work that continues to evolve as we as we go forward together. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you as a as an umbrella organization, I'm extremely grateful of of you know what I've been seeing from. Both you and Earl, you know, Earl Franks, Dr. Earl Franks being the executive director over at uh, NAESP, just uh, seeing the intentionality on both your parts to, to be bringing the nationals together, working together and, and really advocating together. Because there's no doubt, uh, while you know, we need strong national associations from uh, uh, for, for multiple reasons, that national advocacy is, is particularly important. Um, and and as always, you know, education's at the forefront. We got a lot going on. But you know, we're we're this this business of of school leadership's always been tough historically over time, Ron. But you know, it feels like education's we're we're dealing with things where schooling is being a bit weaponized right now politically. Yeah. You know, I mean, we got a bit of that that we're dealing with. We got Uvalde and and now you know the, the gun control issues and mass shootings. I, I do want to spend a little time on that in just a little bit. Um, you know, and and that's all on top of just trying to teach kids. <laughs> You know, teach, give them, give them an education, meet standards, all of, all of that kind of stuff. You know, and, and me with, uh, with, I just had a graduate, but I still got four kids in the K twelve system, and uh, really interested in them getting those things that they need as well. So, uh, so the work that you're doing at the national level and, and having conversations, and things with those national policymakers is is extremely important. Well, first of all, congratulations on the graduate. No, yes, no, thank you. No, that's not a that's not a simple feat, especially today, right? Uh, hey, listen, my my a lot of credit to her. She was out. Emma did a wonderful job uh, through her schooling, but also to her mom. Uh, I married way up, Ron. So uh, just know I way out kicked my. I as well, Jason. I, well, and you've met her. You've met Ashley, so you know that uh, <laughs> people look at her, look at me, and like, dude, I don't know how you made that work, but uh, there you go. I asked fast. Let's just put it that way. All right, so I'll get off that, but. But yeah, I mean, uh, we got we got a lot of hard work to be doing as school leaders. Well, you know, this is where this call and commitment to service really matters, right? Like when when uh, NASSP before I before the pandemic, as I've understood, the NASSP was always was had never thought about any kind of remote work, or it was all in person. And under uh, uh, Joanne's leadership, uh, Joanne Bartoletti's leadership, they had to pivot like literally within a week to go from 100% in person, like no telework to all of a sudden remote. And so, you know, there's growing, as you well know, there's growing pains with that. And I've, I came on board in December of 2020. So, you know, uh, having to figure out like how to do all that work remote and everything. And this credit, as always, like you will say, the credit to the, the team, the team didn't miss anything along the way. Like, you know, they figured it out and, mm -hmm. but but from an evolutionary standpoint, we have to talk about like, you know, in December of 2020, the world was super difficult, right? It's not, it wasn't as difficult as it is today to the points that you just brought up, you know, but it was difficult back then. And, you know, I, I have people that know it internally have heard me say it every single, every single staff meeting, every time and guys like, I understand this is hard for us, but we exist to serve our school leader members and, Many of them are having a rough go at this. And so like the question I ask the team all the time is, what did we do to help school leaders today? What did we do to help student leaders today? And, you know, it, it, really, it really was a, was a call to action for us to say, like, I understand we're tired and I understand we're having, you know, this is difficult and we've got all these changes and you got a new guy on, you know, we're going through all this strategic planning, but our focus needs to be 100% on the, our members because our members at both the, you know, at the membership, individual membership level, and then to without in, in this, in this context of this conversation, our membership with our state associations is absolutely critical. And so 
Um, I'm not glad for the pandemic, but the, you know, it was it was really helpful to rally around that because people could see that real, like, you know, it was clear. It wasn't it wasn't hidden anymore. The struggles that our, our our members have have gone through and continue to go through, and sort of as we come out of this. And so, uh, I couldn't think of a as, as as difficult as it was and continues to be. I couldn't think of a more important calling than to be in a place to really address the needs of of our members. And it's it's a real honor to be, you know, part of that. Just yeah, yeah. So what do you see right now, Ron? Let's let's again continue to put Uvalde off to the side for just a bit. Sure. Um, but besides that, and again, we'll we'll come to that. What else do you see, policymakers and things? Because you've got you've obviously got Department of Ed experience. You know, you you worked in the Obama administration. You've got it at the state level, uh, yep. from your home state of Hawaii. All of that, you know, what what do you see policymakers being particularly engaged in right now, um, as especially as we think about you know this this evolution out of the the pandemic and trying to get ourselves back to this sense of normalcy, the, a new normal, obviously not the same as what we were when we came into it, but you know what what types of things are they talking about? What are how should school leaders look to be engaged in those conversations to make sure that we chart the right course? Yeah with them and their students in mind, rather than just things that, I mean, you know, Paul, <laughs> non-practitioners have a lot of ideas of things that maybe really aren't gonna be all that helpful. Though they think they are, and I think their hearts are in the right place. Yeah, that isn't always the case, right? So. No. Well, right now, really, you know, this mental health, the mental health issues, and rightly so, uh, are are at the top of many folks at the policy and decision-making tables, minds and hearts. and you know, it's, that's a big change from back in the day when mental health stuff was kind of, you know, you have to keep that on the low. It was, you know, it was, it was very stigmatized still is, but you know, it was more stigmatized than it was now. And so that one, the, the mental health, mental health of kids and the well being of kids for sure is, uh, is a, a hot topic and something that people are very passionate about. Uh, real close to that, I think is the mental health and well being of teachers and principals and support staff and, you know, uh, educators, because, um, you know, it's hard, right? People are starting to realize it's hard for people to give their best in service of others if they've, they're dealing with their own, you know, personal issues and matters. And so that's, that's a big one. The, this, you know, this safety component, I, I'm not, you know, the, whether it's uh, gun safety or, you know, uh, uh, emotional safety or, you know, physical safety, I mean, those that, that, that conversation, especially with the, the, you know, all of the events, but especially the recent ones, which really, you know, really, really hurt. Not that any one incident is, is more important or more significant than the other, but, you know, the Uvalde and then before that Buffalo, I mean, these are, these are tough. And so uh, there's a lot of conversation about like, you know, what to do next. Right. And it ranges all the way from, you know, you know, gun safety, gun control, through, you know, hardened facilities, through, you know, additional supports on the campus, through more training, you know, and all the way on the other spectrum to like arming uh, educators and stuff. So, you know, that there's a lot of conversations from all, you know, parts of the country, all different philosophical and religious and political beliefs. And so there's a lot of that going on right now. And then uh, it, you know, the, the recent events have kind of, uh, uh, taken much more of the, you know, the attention, but there's also this, you know, what are we going to do about this interruptions and in learning? And what, what does that mean for kids who have come up through the pandemic in a way, you know, this disruption in their in, in-person experience and, and the disruption in their development and learning, what does that mean from not just an accountability standpoint, but from a workforce development standpoint, from a, a, you know, what's the future, well, a superintendent who I love and respect forever used to always say, I'm in public education because some of these young folk are going to be signing my retirement check. I want, <laughs> them to be, I want them to be the best and brightest and smartest possible. And, you know, that, that statement's still true today, right? Like we've got, this is the future workforce that we, we are, all of our members work on developing the, the best workforce we can possibly muster for the country. And, best citizens and the best workforce. And there's a lot of implications for this interruption in the learning cycle, especially for kids that may not have had all the support systems and safety nets that 
that you know many children do in this country you know as unfortunately there are a number of a lot of kids significant numbers of kids that don't have those safety nets and you know uh whether they have the safety nets or not there's a lot of attention being paid on so what does that mean for our economy going forward what does that mean for the future of our country going forward and so um as i said quite you know overshadowed as of late with the events but but still significant conversations about those three those are the three big buckets i think yeah yeah and every one of those in and of themselves is significant you put oh. those three together that's quite the hat trick uh right i mean just just a lot a lot of things to consider let's let's drill down in, into uh you know with what we've been facing with mass shootings and of course that brings up a whole lot of things with regards to just physical safety of, yeah. of individuals yeah. you know the, the campuses itself we start talking about doors hardening the shell should yeah. we be arming more people in buildings and and yeah. so on and so forth uh which which are, are not easy and, and of course we'll be debating a lot of, with regards to that i, I guess a couple of questions that I have for you, Ron, with regards to this. I mean, obviously this is something that the ASSP has done a lot of work with and you brought a group of principals together. They you know, call it the, the group that nobody wants to belong to because you're talking about school leaders who have dealt with shootings on their campuses. Um, and unfortunately, too many of them have, have lost students and some of them several numbers of students and staff as, as a result. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the work is of that group and, and what they're trying to sure. do to, to just provide support to the field? Sure. And, and Jason, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the Principal Recovery Network. And, uh, you know, since we're, there's an opportunity to do so, I just really want to give a shout out to Frank DeAngelis and all the members of the um, Principal's Recovery Network, because the idea wasn't NASSPs. The idea came from Frank and a bunch of principals who were going through this, uh, unfortunately had experienced it and are still going through it. And, you know, every time a new one happens, they go through oh, yeah. it, right? PTSD, like, right? Yep. Yeah, PTSD and a whole bunch of other things. And just a real credit to them as people and professionals that they're willing to, you know, take on this addition, more triggers and more trauma, you know, because they're so concerned about those that are, you know, immediately experiencing it. What can they do to support them? So, they came to NASSP before my time, obviously, and uh, you know, a credit to to the uh, Joanne Bartoletti and uh, Amanda Carhughes and the team, uh, Greg Waples, who on our team, who who you know saw the need for it and saw the value in it and started it. And then we, you know, continue me coming on board. It's one of the first groups that I I interacted with. I had a chance to meet with, and then it's, so what the group does is. Whenever there's a, they meet regularly and they talk about, you know, what they, what they've experienced and what they learned. So they're a support group to each other in, in, in one facet. And then they are a support group to, unfortunately, those who are, who are, or going to experience, you know, are experiencing these same kind of school shootings. And what they do is they, when a new one comes out and when a, when a new incident is made known, one of the members reaches out directly to the principal and we've expanded it now so at nassp if we have a nhs chapter as you well know uh nassp principals founded the national honor society mm -hmm. yep. and we still administer the program at both the elementary middle, uh junior and the, you know the, the 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 graduate level uh, nhs so if we have a chapter uh, or a national student council chapter at the school because we, we administer the national student council as well we will reach out at the advisor level to them and offer any support but, but the principals recovery network also reaches out to the principals and uh touches base with them to say look we're here for you you know we've been through it so you don't have to really explain anything to us we can understand and so they provide that real direct support to the principal and we do the same thing in, in through the outreach through our chapters there and and all, all our mission is to be a safe place our mission is to really be a safe place for them so that you know with all the stuff going on like how do you have a place where you can talk about these things and many of the members tell us that like they really don't feel safe talking about this to anybody else and yeah. you know having a brother or sister who's been through it can talk them through it and really understand without having to translate you know to explain themselves is really a reflect refreshing place and so um, they do that that and then and they have been they have been very they have been stalwart advocates for it but the media has been the media has been challenging for them because 
you know, for example, anytime a school shooting comes up, the, the boilerplate language always says, well, in Columbine, you know, or Sandy Hook, right? Sure. Like, so it, you know, it re-triggers stuff and, it, and what, and sometimes the you know, well-intentioned media questions cause them, you know, more duress, right? Because they're, they're trying to answer these questions. Well, they've come to a point now where they're like, look, our voice needs to be heard. And so while it's, it's personally, can be personally triggering and challenging for them, I'm very, very proud and respectful of, and, you know, I'm just, these are heroes in my mind, you know, because they're dealing with all this stuff and they still want to help other people. And so for them to now be, you know, more confident in using their voice and using their voice in, in a very powerful and big way has been um, a huge blessing in disguise because it, it humanizes and brings a real life perspective to these issues because, you know, you can get desensitized. You, See the media, there oh, is another one and there's another one. It's like, you know, we have a school shooting for every four and a half days, 4.5 right. days. There's another one. This is like, and you know, there are other more, you know, there are other more developments of community-based shootings, not necessarily school centric, but those are just as horrific. And so um, them now picking up the more, you know, to be more, more uh, resolute in their advocacy is really is. So we're on a, hundred thousand percent behind that because they speak from experience and they tell a story that makes it like much more approachable to, to understand the human element of what people go through here. And that's not always captured by folks that may not have had that firsthand experience. And so uh, that's a lot, Jason, but that's kind of the sort of summary of what's going on with the PRN. Yeah. And I appreciate the, the background there and, and sharing just, you know, what, the importance of that group is because I think it's informative for all of us that have maybe not had that experience and, you know, can learn some things from them as, as we just try to work with our communities here too, because even though you may be in a community that hasn't experienced that you're, you're dealing with, you know, issues of prevention and, and then just processing through a, a, a traumatic experience, maybe not, obviously not to the scale of someone who's dealing with it up close, but, but we're all in pain uh, I, I just think as human beings, number one, as, as members of this country and, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just hard stuff. And, um, and it's, it's, we're fortunate to have their leadership with regards to this, but this it kind of takes me to, to one of my next questions or mm-hmm. you know, just ponderings for you, Ron, and something I've been rhetorically kind of dealing with is, you know, how do we, for school leaders, for those of us that, that haven't experienced, you know, school shootings yeah. uh, up close and personal, but still are interested in doing something, you know, and, and making sure that it's done in an appropriate way, yep. uh, be it advocacy or, or, you know, through professional learning preparation in our school, that, that kind of thing. You know, what are, what are thoughts that, that you have related to that? And, and then also maybe how, how are ways that uh, school leaders could engage, uh, you know, NASSP in some of those efforts? So what well, Jason, wow, that's okay. So, so that's a big loaded question. So it's, Ron. It's so a lot, take but, on as much of that as you can. <laughs> It's so relevant. So thank you. You know, yeah. as always, you, 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 the conversations you and I continue to have are always good ones. You know, they're always wholesome. I look forward to them. So thank you. The, a couple of things. Number one, um, I'll start with the part that I forgot to say, which is, you know, when you have practitioners at the table who speak from experience, the things that they talk about are usually different than the people who are coming from somewhere else that are mm-hmm. like in the think tank or in the policy space. They, they're usually if their area of focus, the grain size of what they talk about is a little different, you know? So, so for policy folks, will talk about these big sweeping things, you know, we need to do these things. Well, when you get into the practitioner voice and the practitioner space, as you well know, it was really eye-opening to me to find out, like, you know, when you talk about these incidents, these horrific incidents, you know, everybody thinks about like the safety EMS, you know, that kind of, you know, response kind of thing, right? And you think about those for for good reason, because, you know, protecting the saving lives is, par- you know, paramount, right? That's, and, and then sort of the aftermath of that is making sure that people have support networks and systems, but things that you don't think about that I never thought about in these scenarios. And, uh, I've been through a couple incidents in my career, um, but never been the building principal of, of one of them, you know, uh, thankfully. But they, the stuff that the PRN talks with the members about is all these other things that nobody talks about. In Like, for example, what happens when you get all this community outpouring and you've got all this stuff, you know, 
uh, memorials outside, people commissioning artwork and sending in letters and poetry. Like, who responds to, you know, people get mail. They, these sites get mail from all over the world because people yeah. just are drawn, you know, like the, the, the trauma and the pain. People come genuine, but, you know, what do you do with all that? Right? Yeah. You're, you know, schools get a lot of mail already, but now all of a sudden you're getting bags of mail coming in every day. You know what? Who's going to respond? Schools aren't, you know, nobody envisioned a, a world in which you had to have that. Like, yeah. and so, you know, things like that, that, you know, people donating stuff to schools that may or may not be appropriate or relevant, but well-intentioned, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things with like the human condition kind of responses that they deal with. So that that's, a, I didn't say that. And that's a huge value to the affected, you know, the ones who are going through it at the time, because they, you know, you don't think of that when you're worried about yeah. EMS and other things, you don't worry about like, man, what am I going to do with all this stuff showing up? But what no, you're dealing with the issues in the moment, right? Like what's, what's right in front of you at right now? Yeah. What if a community group comes up and they, we want to erect a statue on the campus to memorialize <laughs> yeah. the deaths and that triggers everybody in the school community every single day mm -hmm. when they show up at school, like, you know, is that, is that the, it's well-intentioned and it's a great gesture, but is that the right thing for the yeah. well-being of the school and the healing of the school. So all those kinds of things. Now, your question about, uh, you know, what, what can school leaders do? And I think this is something that we've known uh, since the beginning of time as I'd known it as a teacher and I, I tried my best to, to live, live up to it. And especially the, the further I got away from the classroom, I tried to live up to it more because it, it, it mattered. It mattered. It seemed to me that mattered more, but I can't stress enough how important the value of a principal or a school leader, assistant principal, or any educator really having positive and healthy relationships with both the kids and the educators on the campus and support staff on the campus. The, this relationship piece is, it's often poo-pooed by folks and, 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 and downplayed as just like just, just a it's touchy feely, but this relationship thing is game changing and, and mm -hmm. life saving. And so, I think as a school leader, you know, whether or not you're yet tangling with first responder plans, emergency preparation, safety plans, evacuations, you know, shelter in place, all of that stuff, the foundation of that is always going to be relationships. So that, that's one. Second, I think um, the PRN is going to, is getting ready. They're, they've been working on now for a while and are, are, we're getting ready to publish a guide, a, a, a sort, of, sort of checklist, a resource for folks. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, when we when we make that available, I strongly su suggest it won't be for sale. You know, it's going to be a, a, a thing that NASSP is sponsoring. But when that comes out, you know, familiar, familiarize yourselves with it because it's 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 that club that nobody wants to belong to. It's a thing that you got to prepare for that you nobody wants to prepare for. And yeah. this resource guide is, I promise everyone here, this resource guide is going to be nuggets of wisdom, just one after the other, right? Like, and it's it's sad that we have to get excited about something like that, but it's necessary. And so. Yeah. And then the third thing I think, Jason, which is relevant to the, some of the other things you wanted to talk about is, and, and I'm not saying it because you're, you know, IPA and we're NASSP and we're all in this together, but every single school leader needs to be a member of their respective state and national association. And if they're not IPA members, please go out, find a buddy or a friend or an acquaintance who's not a member of IPA and talk to them about why they need to be part of their local state professional association and why they need to be a member as part of that with their national association, mm -hmm. because this, there's a hundred thousand schools in the country. And we, I found this in my travels around the country. We might look different. We might be from different zip codes, we might have different philosophical and political religious beliefs. We might have all of those things, but when we talk about school and kids, the conversations are, we're on a hundred percent on the same page. And so we need to rise up together collectively and have a voice. And so uh, IPA members, if you're not active in IPA, like you're a member, but you don't always show up in the stuff, you need to be there. You need to be partnering with IPA because I IPA is a powerful advocate for you in ways that you may not be aware of. And you, you, they need you. And I'm speaking for you, Jason. I'm sorry. They need you. And <laughs> I'm grateful you need for them. it. You, they need you and you need them. And Absolutely I'll do the exact them. same thing for the national we are yep. nothing at the national level without state associations and we're nothing at the national level without members of state associations. Right. So like, I could well, we not... can't have a collective voice, Ron, if there's not a collective, right? 
I mean, that just that is impossible. You know, and our membership just eclipsed 6,000 here not long ago. And that's a powerful statement when you're talking with policymakers and things about about the size of that at the state level. And, and I think about, you know, an issue as divisive as this one can be related to anything with guns. Right. Yep. Um, and I'm a farm kid and, and lived yep. around guns and all that hunt, all those things now. But I still feel like that there's some real common sense things that we can look at doing here that can yep. make all of us safer. And what's fascinating to me is that there is pretty broad agreement nationally. When you look at the polls, like, you know, politicians have done more with less with less support yep. than what we have around some of these issues for something that, it, you know, is spoken to in the Constitution as a constitutional right. And what I appreciate about NASSP's position related to this, uh, which, again, is going to take collective voice to make anything happen, is to t- just, just tell policymakers, do something. It's all the yep. same thing come out of NAESP as well. I mean, do yep. something. And and because there is a pathway there, there's obviously some reasonable things that can be done because to do nothing, you know, that's what the that's the best definition of an insanity is if we do the same thing and expect a different result. That's not going to that's not going to help us at all. And so I, I appreciate your position there as an association. And, 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 and I appreciate you, you know, looping us in as part of that, that we've got to be doing this together. We need our collective memberships uh, in order to get it done. Otherwise, it just, that just isn't going to happen. Uh, you know, I've been having served in 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 principal and assistant principal roles and in, in, in the district superintendent role. You know, I, I know it. The world gets busy and there's there's, you know, the world was busy back when I was in the seat, but it wasn't as busy as it is now. That's for sure. Sure as heck <laughs> wasn't as complicated as now. And my dad used to tell me the same thing when he, when he was coming up. Like, oh, it was back in the day. How you got it now, son, is really hard. Too bad it's you. And I'm, I'm lucky I'm retired. My dad used to tell me that all the time, right? Like, yeah. but this is where I think, you know, and I've been in this spot before when oh other people got the ball they're carrying it so i don't need you know i got a lot of stuff going on i don't need to i don't need to jump in on you know and this is not the time for that like this is why we've taken this we took the stand like look we're gonna stay in our lane our lane nassp our lane is we're all about what's right for kids and we're all about what's right for those who support kids so for us we're like you we're a Nonpartisan organization. We have members from every zip code, every walk of life, every possible religious, philosophical, you know, whatever, whatever states of being that people want to contextualize. We have members from all over the spectrum of that. And so our job is not to go out there and, and uh, you know, promote personal agendas or personal ideas or political ones. Our job is to stand up for what's right in this country. And this is the thing about the, you mentioned I've been very fortunate to travel around and meet members in, like yours in Illinois, mm-hmm. but but members in Missouri, you know, like I've been all over the place. I've been in Oklahoma, Minnesota, everywhere, Maine, all over the place. And everywhere I go, we're all connected by the same philosophical and fundamental belief structures. And so there's very little disagreement between our members. But what we have not done as a profession is all band together and make it known that we all stand together. Mm-hmm. You know, with respect to all of our individual and personal beliefs and you know structures, but when it comes to kids and what's right for kids and what's right for the people who support kids, there's very little separation. Yeah, you know, and there there are reasons why. I, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there are reasons why folks don't want practitioners. I'm not saying anybody overtly wants to block practitioners, but but there's reasons why because. I said it in the in the example about the PRN. When you get practitioners in the room, we talk about things that are a little different than what other people want to talk about in their agenda. Mm-hmm. And the reason they don't want to talk about it is because those are the sticky things that cause all kinds of challenges. And it's much easier to gloss over them than to, especially from a position of if you weren't a practitioner or you never served or you haven't been doing this for a long time, you really don't know the nuance of that. So it's uncomfortable to talk about it. Well, we're not asking people to be experts in those things. We're asking, hey, we have experts. Why don't you just elevate them to the table, invite them into the conversation and hear what they have to say? Because a lot of the stuff that our that practitioners bring to the table might sound irritating, like from a, all the reasons why we can't do it standpoint. But if we address those issues, then the implementation and the outcome and the impact is going to be much, it's a much smoother runway and an off-ramp to get those results. And so 
this is, you know, back to your question, this is what educators need to do. One, they, they, one, they need to familiarize themselves and be part of it. Two, they need to really, you know, take a more active role in their state associations. And if they're not a member, need to be one and recruit everybody they can think of to be a member of their state association and the national. And third, they just, well, I kind of reversed the order, but relationships like this, this focus on culture and relationships. Uh, the worse it gets, the more we got to focus on relationships, yeah. right? Because kids are resilient. They know I've been to, I don't know, this, this year alone, I've been to, I don't know, tons of schools. And yeah. you can tell right away when the kids, you can tell what the culture is when they like, just in the way the kids acknowledge or don't acknowledge the principal or, or the assistant principal or whatever school figures when we're walking around, you can you can see it when the kids feel comfortable. They're like, you know, you know that. And then the principal will always say something like, well, yeah, you know, that kid, man, that kid was real on the ropes. And this just happens every day when I visit that kid was on the ropes, but you know, we, we rallied around him or her and we got the team around it. And they look, they're on track and you can see it. The kid's like, Hey, what's up, Mr. Lay? How you doing? You know, like oh, yeah. it's not this, Ooh, there's the principal relationship. And so. Well, I always tell people, uh, cause I visit a lot of schools myself. And I, I say there, there are two truths I found in the years of, of, of several buildings that I've been in since I've been sitting in the seat here at IPA. Two truths. One, we still lack a lot of equity in this state. You know, <laughs> when you've got some schools that have an indoor pool, a Broadway style playhouse, a huge auditorium and, you know, football fields, yada, yada. And those others that are, you know, having classes and trailers. So that's an issue. The second one is, and this is where school leadership really comes into play. The personality of the school takes on the personality of the principal. Absolutely. Every day of the week, every time. That's a, those that choose to, to, you know, to do these jobs have to understand the responsibility of those positions and, and how so much keys off of, of you as leaders. You know, and I'm speaking to those, obviously, that, uh, that are in those seats right now. It's, it's big time. It's important. Um, but you know, of all the things, and I'm going to kind of take us out of, out of this this really deep and, and heavy conversation we've had, Ron. And I, I will tell you, when I, when I, we got this on our calendar about three or four weeks ago, I thought, man, I'm I'm really excited about this conversation with Ron. It'll it'll be pretty upbeat. We'll you know we'll maybe get into some tougher stuff. I sure wasn't planning on having us to to consider the tough things we've had to, but obviously that was important for us to do. But you know, besides when we we think about the, the tragedies here in Uvalde and and otherwise. These are tough jobs no matter what, but man, they are so important. And oh. the opportunity for impact and all of that is huge. And, you know, and I think about like some of my favorite movies that I've watched over the years, like, you know, I'm a sci-fi geek. I love things like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and all of that. And, and you know, what makes those stories so awesome are people persevering through the most difficult of circumstances. And, and think about the stories that our, our school leaders across the country are going to be able to tell um, and what they've been able to persevere through and, and being able to have impact for. And man, while it's not been easy uh, for any of us through all of that, um, it just speaks to how great these jobs really are. And, and hopefully with summer and an opportunity to step away from it a little bit, we'll be able to gain some, some, some perspective back on that as we gear back up to, to get going you know, this fall. So just, just some thoughts there, but I want to kind of leave the, the last word here for you, Ron, as you think about, you know, what are some thoughts that you would share with school leaders as they go into the summer and, and then, you know, get themselves ready to go here for the fall, especially when we think about all this, the stuff that we've been dealing with. Well, thanks, Jason. And man, you, you never fails. You, you open up a bunch of doors and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm <laughs> talking about that too. So I won't, I won't, you know, I won't uh, stray from it, but First thing, uh, school leaders, you know, IPA members, thank you for the work that you you do for children and families every single day. Uh, may not always feel like it, but as Jason said, which I completely agree with, this is such a fundamental. This the, the role of school leadership and ultimately of schools is so fundamentally important to the 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 the, the essential fabric of our country and our democracy and. Uh, I'm just thrilled and honored to be in an association that that is working to support you in in all of your work. So um, just know that, like, while you don't maybe society isn't quite yet at the place where they understand how important that role is yet, you know, all of society, I should say, 
uh, just keep doing the great work you're doing because it's, it, it really matters. And people won't notice how much it matters until you're, you, you're not in it anymore. And then they'll realize, oh my God, what just happened? Which is, it's kind of like emergency preparation, right? You can't prepare enough. And people only want to do the afterward. Oh, well, how come we didn't have this? And how come we didn't have that? It's kind of like that in schools. I think people take it for granted in a way, don't realize what really goes into a quality school and quality school experience. So thank you for that. Second, you, Jason, you said it already and you're bad at it. I'm sure I'm bad at it too, but we're going to say it for the sake of the conversation. You need to take care of yourself. Yeah. Members, this is, I know we're all, you know, we're all tough and everybody's used to the holding the whole world on their back and walking around like Atlas, you know, and <laughs> but you can't be the best that you need to be for kids and families if you're not at your best yourself. And so, uh, as again, I'm not, I'm not preaching to anybody here cause I'm terrible at it, but, but, you know, we really do need to at least think about like, I need to take care of myself. I need to do things so I can, you know, reset my brain and, you know, get in some exercise or get in some quiet time or whatever for that. And then third, I think, um, and this is related to, to advocacy. Um, we have to just be school leaders got to be better about speaking up and on these broader issues of importance mm -hmm. because you are, and I'm speaking directly to your members here. You are respected in your, in your, your school communities. Research bears that out as one of the most respected. One of the most, one of the most trusted the public right. leaders in all of the professions. And so, right. You know, you use that you use not use, but your your relationships matter when you're you know getting support for initiatives at the school. Your relationships matter when you're trying to, for example, get a bond funding to build more facilities or work with people. Partnerships in the community, partnerships with you know those kinds of your relationship interactions with kids. But where we fall short all the time because we've always been conditioned that other people have are carrying that torch. Well, this is the age of authenticity and credibility and there are no more authentic and credible people than the people who do the work every single day and so ipa members and soon to be ipa members and NASSP soon to be nassp members, members right nassp yep. members you got to be involved mm -hmm. and the perfect place to start that involvement is at your local state association level because jason and his whole team have got a hundred million ways for you to one, be involved and two, to be increasingly involved in an engagement way over the, over the course of time. And you may not realize it until you actually take advantage of it, but this is a huge resource to you and for you. And you need to be involved in that. I was taught when I was coming up that being a professional meant being a part of my professional organization and doing my own reading and my own research and my own learning. And those two tenets are still true today. In fact, they're more true today than they were back in the day, because back in the day, things weren't as complicated as they were as they are now. So, uh, and then the final thing I will say is, um, you know, when you're having a crappy day, you know, if you don't already do it, keep a crappy day folder. And when you get a note from a kid or a letter from a, or an email from a, a colleague or uh, somebody on staff that, you know, sent you a note that was like, you know, Mr. Leahy, I was having a really crappy day. I really appreciate the conversation we had the other day. It helped me put those in your crappy day folder and keep that crappy day folder handy. And when it, when, whenever things get rough or whatever, you go back to that happy place and you pull out one of those things and you remember your why, because your why can't be bought. It's not for sale. You can't fake it. And that's what makes you the powerful leader and the, and the servant leader that you are. And Forces of evil will try to get you away from that. They'll try to get you to play another game, you know, be divisive, be antagonistic, da, da, da. Just go back to your why. You exist to serve others and you're about what's right for kids and what's right for adults. That's all you need to get through it every single day. And then, of course, you, if, if you have questions about that, call Jason and IPA. And, and if he has questions about that, he'll call NASSP, which he, he usually doesn't. But if he has <laughs> questions about it, he'll call me an NASSP. And that's why we're here to support you, both of us. Well, Ron Nazoe, CEO of NASSP, sure appreciate your time and your perspective and just sharing a little bit about uh, what's going from the, on with the National Association right now. Thanks for joining me. Jason, it's always a pleasure. Anything I can do, anything I or NASSP can do to support IPA and all of your members, man, just you, you know what it is. Just 
just give a call, shoot a text, and we're we'll figure it out, man. You bet, you bet. Well, that's that's mutual, obviously, for sure. Well, my name is Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. Again, joined by Ron as always CEO of NASSP. Always grateful to to be able to to talk with him and Ron. All those IPA plugs, the 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 check will be in the mail, uh, just so you know. But uh, but you're grateful for that. That's just, that's just love, brother. I, <laughs> I know, and I'm grateful. And, and, no. and it goes both <laughs> ways for sure. But if there's anything that either IPA or NASSP could do for you, uh, don't hesitate to call us. And you can check us out on the web at uh, nassp.org or ilprinciples.org. Take care. <laughs>